presence of Almighty God and you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola, do by the womb of the Virgin and the Matrix of God and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ Christ in the region and is the true and only head of the Catholic or Universal Church throughout the earth. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine and His Holiness right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority and all adherents in regards that they be usurped and heretical opposing the sacred mother, Church of Rome. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagating of the mother church's interest. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. I furthermore promise and declare that I will wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, and flay and strangle and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs of the wounds of their women, and crush their infant heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. charismatic movement. What's, what's the connection with that? The charismatic movement is serving the purpose, uh, as we said, of uh, one of the many issues. Uh, as we said about Saturdays and Sunday, uh, they'll pick up every issue with different denominations. And in the case of the charismatic movement, they pick up the, the charismatic movement because one factor. They could not bring under subjection the Pentecostal denominations. They couldn't. They could not. Even when they went to the ecumenical movement before from 1945 down to our day, since at this uh, already starts, as a matter of fact, if you want to know, the World Council of Churches started by financed by the Jesuits in Europe in 1945 after the end of the Second World War already, or by the time that the World War was uh, to end there, already the Jesuits were at work trying to unite all the Protestants in Europe. Uh, and that was the origin of the World Council of Churches and the Ecumenical Movement. Today the Charismatic Movement is serving that purpose. Where the Pentecostal could not be brought into the Ecumenical Forum, they brought it through the exercise a Charismatic Gift. Uh, many of these militants organizations uh, I train and prepare how they can become Baptists, how they can become Adventists, how they can become uh, 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 Methodists, how they can become Presbyterian, how they can become Pentecostal, and all these areas where they must infiltrate any area. Please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, as we continue our prophetic sermon series titled, The Coming Fourth Reich, and this sermon, The Final Farewell. 
The most exciting event the world has ever seen in the past 2,000 years is about to happen. It's called the rapture of the redeemed Church of Jesus Christ. It's called the rapture of the redeemed Church of Jesus Christ. I'm delighted to present my latest book, In Defense of Israel. This book will expose the sins of the fathers and the vicious abuse of the Jewish people. In Defense of Israel will shape Christian theology. It scripturally proves that the Jewish people as a whole did not reject Jesus as Messiah. It will also prove that Jesus did not come to earth to be the Messiah. In Defense of Israel will shape Christian theology. It scripturally proves that the Jewish people as a whole did not reject Jesus as Messiah. It will also prove that Jesus did not come to earth to be the Messiah. It's called the rapture of the redeemed Church of Jesus Christ. Something began to change. First with Dr. Uh, you know, Cyrus Schofield. C.I. Schofield was a divorced man. He had trouble with alcohol. He was a lawyer turned preacher. He left his first wife, Leontine Sierre, in 1883. That's the year after he wrote his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. So in 1882, he writes his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. 1883, he leaves his first wife, marries another lady, and then becomes a pastor in Texas very famous, very popular. Schofield's dispensational premillennial Bible was edited with financial assistance from prominent businessmen, some of which had questionable religious ties. And he had Jewish retainers who made him a member of a club called the Lotus Club, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a secret society. And suddenly he had plenty of money. This corrupt lawyer who had abandoned his wife and was found guilty of numerous offenses as, as a corrupt attorney. But Schofield was given money and the Oxford group out of England published his Bible. Why would they take a crooked lawyer and make him the editor of a Bible? And then suddenly they had millions of dollars to promote it. With that amount of money, then the Bible took off. And it, it basically sealed the deal for the Jews. the rapture of the redeemed Church of Jesus Christ. But it's a doctrine that has no basis in Scripture whatsoever, that was in fact concocted and popularized to enable a direct attack on the Gospel, and also on the ministry and the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. This sacred cow doctrine I refer to is none other than the pre-tribulational rapture of the Church. For the past century, Christian eschatology has been greatly influenced by the teachings of a man named Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, also known as C.I. Schofield, editor of the popular Schofield Reference Bible. Since its introduction in 1909, the Schofield Reference Bible has been one of the most popular selling Bibles in print, thanks in large part to the marketing efforts of its sponsor and publisher, England's Oxford University Press. As a result, C.I. Schofield is regarded by many as an eminent Bible scholar and theologian, and by some even a sort of a latter-day prophet as his editorial notes have come to be viewed by some as being as infallible and authoritative as the scriptures themselves, and his teachings have come to be viewed by some as unquestionable, fundamental dogma. But far from being either a respectable scholar, theologian, or a prophet, C.I. Schofield was in fact a blatant heretic that introduced several doctrines that should be seen as damnable heresies, including a false gospel, a false view of Christ's mission and message, a false view of the church and its mission, a false view of the kingdom of God, and a false system of eschatology, all of which directly contradict the clear teachings of Scripture. The brand of futurism and premillennialism that Schofield introduced was not at all that of the apostles and early church. When you take a close look at Schofield's many false doctrines, a clear agenda emerges, indicating that the allegations made by some are in fact true, that Schofield's work was funded and directed by the World Zionist Organization, founded in 1897 by Theodore Herzl and funded by the banking house of the Rothschilds to promote the idea that unbelieving Jews are still God's chosen people. 
that they have a separate covenant with God and do not need to believe in the Messiah Jesus to be saved. An idea that's pushed to extremes today by the Zionist latest poster boy, the heretic from San Antonio, Texas, John Hagee, whose well-known heresy comes right out of the Schofield Bible. In the late 1500s, in order to diffuse the popular belief among Luther and the Reformers that the Pope was the Antichrist, two Jesuits, Francisco Ribera and Cardinal Roberto Bellarmino, concocted a new Roman Catholic doctrine that departed from the Church's preterist position to a Jesuit version of Futurism that saw the Antichrist as being a last day's figure that therefore could not be the papacy. In the 1700s, another Jesuit priest named Manuel Lacunza expanded on the ideas of Ribera and Bellarmino. Lacunza's ideas were published in Spanish under the pen name Rabbi Juan Yosefat Ben Ezra. This book gained popularity throughout Spain and eventually wound up in the hands of a Scottish Presbyterian named Edward Irving, one of the forerunners of the Charismatic and Pentecostal movements, who translated the book into English in 1827 under the title The Coming of the Messiah. It appears that in 1830 Irving started preaching that the rapture will occur in two stages a secret one before the Antichrist, and a public one at the end of the Great Tribulation. John Nelson Darby was 30 years old when news of this new doctrine started becoming popular. He incorporated Irving's ideas into what he called dispensationalism. Darby then visited the United States six times between 1859 and 1874, preaching dispensationalism and the pre-tribulation rapture. Darby greatly impressed the man that would become the biggest promoter of the secret rapture theory, Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. You cannot put new wine, grace, into the old wine skin because the new wine will ferment and you will lose both. Now, under law, God said, I'll by no means pass by your transgressions, but I'll visit your sins to the third and fourth generation. But under grace, God says, I will be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins I will remember no more. That's been a change. That's been a change, church. God is raising ministers of righteousness all over the world. There is a grace revolution on. Perhaps the worst of Schofield's heresies is a false view of Christ's first advent, of his ministry and message. Schofield thought that the teachings of Christ, the gospel and the kingdom message that he preached are not for the church, they were to Israel and the Jews. In effect, the teachings of Schofield on this issue repeat the same lie taught by the Quran and the false prophet of Islam, Mohammed, because both Schofield and Mohammed taught that Christ's message was not for today, that he brought a message that was only intended for his immediate audience that Christ's message was for his time and his people Israel, not to us or for our time today. I'm here to tell you today that for this reason alone, C.I. Schofield should be regarded as an emissary of Satan 
and a very dangerous false prophet. The Bible says in John 1, verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But in his introduction to the New Testament, the four Gospels, Schofield writes, The mission of Jesus was primarily to the Jews. The Sermon on the Mount is law, not grace. The doctrines of grace are to be sought in the epistles, not in the Gospels. In his note at Matthew 5, verse 2, Schofield says, The Sermon on the Mount in its primary application gives neither the privilege nor the duty of the church. These are found in the epistles. And in his original introduction to 2 Corinthians, Schofield blatantly attacked the teachings of our Lord where he says, It is evident that the really dangerous sect in Corinth was that which said, And I have Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12. They rejected the new revelation through Paul of the doctrines of grace, grounding themselves probably on the kingdom teachings of our Lord seemingly oblivious that a new dispensation had been introduced by Christ's death. By the way, here Schofield dares to call Christ our Lord, while in the same paragraph saying the most dangerous sect were those that followed his teachings. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I've got news for you today. C.I. Schofield was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And all those who follow his false gospel that salvation does not require obedience to Christ, will one day find themselves in that group of many that Christ spoke of in Matthew 7, verse 21, who call him Lord, but to whom he will say, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Now listen, listen. The church has it backwards. The church has it backwards. of Trent from 1545 to 1563, a commission of cardinals was put together to clean up the Catholic Church and to reassert its position of authority as the only true Church of God. Fundamental to this movement was the establishment of new religious orders. The most famous order to be created at this time, and the one that has gone on to become the largest in the world, was the Society of Jesus, or as they are more commonly known, the Jesuits. They would become one of the most infamous organisations in history. The founder of the Jesuits was a man called Don Inigo Lopez, who was born into an extremely wealthy family in the Basque region of Spain in 1491. He later changed his name to Ignatius Loyola. He made his way across Spain to the mountains of Montserrat, where there was a Benedictine monastery. Within this monastery was a sacred goddess idol called the Black Virgin of Montserrat, which he stood before in vigil for three days. There he committed himself and his work to her. By doing so, he committed himself to the demonic goddess Asherah. For those ten months he lived in a cave, torturing himself physically and mentally until he began to have dreams and visions. Through these hallucinations he claimed that the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was taught to him by a form in the air near him, and this form gave him much consolation because it was exceedingly beautiful. It somehow seemed to have the shape of a serpent and had many things that shone like eyes but were not eyes. He received much delight and consolation from gazing upon this object, but when the object vanished he became disconsolate. Here we see the telltale signs of a demonic cave revelation, exactly like that which Muhammad experienced. More explicitly than Muhammad's encounter, the being came in the form of a serpent rather than an angel of light. Similar to Muhammad, Loyola found himself prone to depression after contact. By 1534, Ignatius Loyola had six key companions, all of whom he had met at university, and they formed the initial military brotherhood of the Society of Jesus. On the morning of 15th of August, 1534, they met in the crypt of the Church of Our Lady of the Martyrs at Montmartre and took solemn vows committing themselves to their lifelong work. As a man with an army background, Loyola created his order with the principles and disciplines that he had been used to as a soldier. The leader demanded the unquestioning obedience from his inferiors. Loyola was made the first superior general of the order and they began the work of opposing the Reformation and re-establishing the dominance of the Catholic Church in Europe and around the world. They made their way to Rome where, in time, their society was accepted by the Pope, who at that time was Paul III. Paul III had seen the need of such a military order to repel the progress that the Protestant Reformation was making, as the Catholic Church seemed powerless by its own means. The Pope invested in them the authority too. 
Excommunicate all who would hinder or who do not aid the society, to confer orders, preach and administer the sacraments, to change their general, to absolve heretics as well as imprison the excommunicate, to exercise episcopal functions, to confirm, exercise, dispense, etc., to disguise themselves, to carry movable altars, give plenary indulgences, to live exempt, free from secular powers, taxes as well as jurisdiction, authority, sentence and command of any other ordinary delegate, judge magistrate from any search. In other words, the Jesuits were given authority from the Catholic Church to operate above the law and to employ any means necessary to do their work. With this remit in time, the Jesuits became the most prominent and powerful of Catholic weapons against the Reformation. Their constitution justifies this absolute and unquestioning obedience by claiming the general of the Jesuits is in the place of Jesus Christ. Like the Pope, the general has invested in himself spiritual authority for worldly power and control. In more than 500 places in the Jesuit constitution, it is taught that the Jesuits should see Jesus in their general. The blasphemy continues in the constitution saying, No constitution, declaration or any order of living can involve an obligation to commit sin, mortal or venial, unless the superior command it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or by virtue of holy obedience, which shall be done in those cases or persons wherein it shall be judged to conduce to the particular good of each or to the general advantage. And instead of the fear of offence, let the love and desire of all perfection succeed, that greater glory of Christ, our Creator and Lord, may follow. That nonsense just means that the Jesuit superiors can command an inferior to commit a sin in the name of Jesus Christ if they feel the end justifies the means. The order operated on the basis of complete, blind, mechanical obedience to those who are higher up in the hierarchical structure. The entire organisation in turn would be at the disposal of the Pope as an army of the most zealous and dedicated spiritual warriors for the Vatican. They specialised in warfare by stealth and deception to undermine the enemy, the enemy being true Christians of the Reformation. Satan is trying to sneak his poison into Christianity and this is why it's so important we study this stuff so that we're not led astray through lack of knowledge, and so that we learn to recognise deception and evil, even when it comes disguised as an angel of light through the lips of people who claim to be on God's side. By reading these words, we gain a full appreciation of their shocking tactics, which can be summed up like this. Their intention was to become part of the faith, system, culture or group that they intended to destroy. Then from within, they would sow seeds of hate and division. Their method was to present themselves as one thing on the surface, but to be secretly working away with each other for a very different purpose behind the scenes. They would sometimes pretend to be enemies on opposing sides in public, but behind the scenes they were actually cohorts, working together towards the same goal. This type of attack is sometimes referred to as becoming a fifth column, meaning that the most effective way to attack something is not from the north or the south or the east or the west, but from within. Cicero once said, a nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and he carries his banners openly. But the traitor moves among those within the gates freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears not traitor, he speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garments, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation, he works secretly and unknown in the night, to undermine the pillars of a city, he infects the body politic, so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. The fifth column tactic is of course a trademark of Satan. It was the very tactic he used to persuade a third of the angels to fall with him and to become his army of demons. He went around whispering in the ears of anyone who would listen to turn them against God. Now listen, listen. The church has it backwards. Now listen, listen. Now listen, listen. The church has it backwards. In Britain, the Jesuits made use of fifth column tactics. They started filtering into the country in the 1560s, and almost immediately they were found preaching from pulpits disguised as Church of England ministers. In 1568, a Jesuit priest posing as a Church of England minister accidentally dropped a secret copy of instructions on how to undermine and destroy the Church of England. 
After a search of his lodgings, further documents were discovered in his boots, including a license from the Jesuits and a bull from the Pope Pius, which authorised him to preach whatever was necessary to inflame animosities and widen divisions. They saw no better way to demolish churches than to infiltrate it in the guise of a minister who could introduce divisive false doctrines and ceremonies from the pulpit. Why is that important? Because the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. The Jews are sin conscious because they have the law. The law kills. The law kills. Which goes to show the letter, the Ten Commandments, listen, kills. The Ten Commandments, listen, kills. The Ten Commandments, listen, kills. And, and if, if I were the devil, and I'm not the devil, he's not, he's not this good looking, but... Uh, <laughs> and and if, if I were the devil, and I'm not the devil, he's not, he's not this good looking, but... Uh, <laughs> but if, if I were the devil, yes, which teaching would I attack?